I'm Steve Hill, and this is Stuff with Steve, and I'm here at Grace Community Fellowship doing our podcast along with Nick, our producer. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. It's good to be here with you, Steve. Hey, we're going to talk about theology today. Theology. Theos means God. Ology means study. So we're going to talk about the study of God. And what I want to do today is sometimes I get the question, well, what's the difference between liberal and conservative churches? And I want to address that issue or talk about it. But we're not talking about politics. So whenever I use the word liberal theology, it has nothing whatsoever to do with political things. And so liberal churches tend to have bad theology and good bathrooms. Conservative churches have good theology and lousy bathrooms. I don't think that's true. But anyway, so that's a a saying that I've heard. So when we talk about liberal and conservative churches, we're talking about theological beliefs. Now, then, when we talk about these beliefs, I narrow it down to a couple areas that make the distinctions. First, the liberally minded church does not believe in the resurrection of Jesus. The liberally minded church believes that the spirit of Jesus was raised from the dead, but they do not believe his body was raised from the dead. We call that the bodily resurrection of Jesus. The early Christians were sold out 100% that Jesus was alive. It is the, the central piece of the gospel. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says if the resurrection isn't true, all this is dumb, is vain, is the word. The word vain there means empty. So Paul is talking about the, the resurrection is so critically important. And there are churches who do not believe that Jesus bodily was raised from the dead. Uh, A number of years ago, I was driving, listening to a radio show, and they had a professor from Southern Methodist University, a theological professor, who said that there were no miracles in the Bible. Miracles cannot happen. Jesus never walked on the water. Jesus did not feed thousands of people. Miracles are are impossible, this theologian said. And this theologian went on to say that Jesus never came back to life. It was only his attitude or kind of a spiritual dimension that came back to life. And we would call that heresy, basically. We would say that's not an orthodox belief. The early Christians died for that belief. Now, let's just think about it for a minute. Those early first-generation believers, 500 of them saw Jesus alive. It was not a hallucination. 500 people did not have the same hallucination. That is just impossible. They saw Jesus. They saw him physically. Jesus said, hey, touch me here, and here are, the, here are where the nail holes were. And so Jesus was physically raised from the dead. So that is a dividing factor between what we would say a liberal church and a conservative church as well. So the resurrection is is a key facet of that. The next one that I think of is simply that who is Jesus? In a lot in many liberal churches, the Jesus is presented as a good person but not fully God or that Jesus was just a mere teacher or something like that. So the belief in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is absent in some way. So when we talk about Jesus being the Son of God, we're talking about him being fully man and fully God. And so Jesus is just not a good example. Jesus is God himself. We call that the Trinity. Another facet that divides between liberal and conservative theology is simply our approach to salvation. How does somebody have their sins forgiven? How does somebody get to heaven? How do I begin a relationship with God? And what I would say, a conservative church would say, is that is that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. Or as I've said earlier, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I can't do anything to earn it. I can't do anything to make God love me more. It's simply a matter of faith in Jesus. So the other aspect, and it's the church tradition that I grew up in, actually, uh, promoted is, well, you just need to be a good person. And if you're good enough, the good outweighs the bad, you're going to be in. And there's all kinds of problems with that. First off, Scripture says over and over again 
that salvation is by faith. 200 times in the New Testament, the word faith is used, believe, concerning salvation. 200 times. 98 of those are in the Gospel of John alone. And so it's faith in Christ, not my good works. It begs the question, begs the question, how good is good enough? I mean, how good would you have to be? Do you you have to say so many Hail Marys or go to church so many times? Do you have to give so much money? Do you have to be nice to people? All those may be good things, but how good is good enough? You will never know the answer to that question, and you will be frustrated. You will be insecure in your life if you're if you're not convinced that salvation is a free gift by faith. So those are three things that separate, I think, conservative from liberal churches theologically. And the fourth and the last one is simply Scripture, approach to Scripture. In the theologically conservative church, uh, we love the Bible, and we think that the Bible is free from error. We call that inerrancy, and that the Bible comes from God. It's inspired by God. The word inspired, all Scripture is inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16. And that word inspired means God breathe. So you can think of it this way. This example probably lacks, but God has a thought. It goes across his vocal cords. He doesn't have vocal cords. Don't send me an email. I know that. And that thought comes to us. So it's God breathed. I have a thought in my head. I talk. It comes out. So God is giving us his message in the Bible, and that's what... That's what we mean when we talk about that God breathed. So we're talking about inspiration of Scripture, that it it comes from God. So in many theologically liberal churches, Scripture sometimes is not held in high view. Let me put it that way. There's a low view of Scripture. This plays out in a number of ways. First, it plays out that some of our Bible does not belong in the Bible, so a that frame of reference says some of the books of the New Testament don't belong there. And on the other hand, there are many other books of the Bible that should be – there are many other books that should be included in the Bible. And we'll talk about that at a later time. How do we know that our Bible is correct? But in a conservative theological church, we just place a high value on Scripture itself. So this whole issue of liberal versus conservative church – We're talking about theology, not politics. We use those terms. But how did this happen? How did this happen? And so I'll give you the uh, quick history lesson. In the 1700s, Christianity took a firm hold academically in Germany, and there were many German theologians. And some of those theologians began to contemplate that the Bible is not true. So the attack first started with Scripture, and it was called form criticism or redaction criticism of the Bible, and that certain parts of it probably aren't true was their thinking. And so there was great doubt placed upon the Bible. And then I'm going to say maybe 100 years after that with people like German theologian Adolf von Harnack, he began to say, we need to have a quest for the real historical Jesus because what we have in Scripture is just the ramblings of, of John and Mark and Luke and Paul, and, and those were created by the early church and aren't exactly true. We need to find the real Jesus. And he used the term demythologize Jesus, that what conservative Christians see in Jesus is just a myth, and we need to change that. And that kind of thinking eventually came into the church. The Bible's not true. Jesus isn't who he says he is. Resurrections can happen because, well, miracles can happen. It goes against science. And so those things began to bring wedges into the church and separate churches. So because of that, some denominations fell hook, line, and sinker for some of this thinking. And I'm going to say some denominations out loud, but it doesn't mean that every church who belongs to the denomination uh, buys into this or holds to those views. And so I'm not trying to paint everybody into the same corner. So let's talk about the United Methodist Church. That's the church that I grew up in. 
when I was growing up in it and was trying to decide whether to become a pastor, my Methodist pastor told me never go to a Methodist seminary. He said, you'll lose your faith. And he could not recommend any seminary because of these views. And so it's predominant in the United Methodist Church, these things about the resurrection, about Scripture, about is Jesus really the Son of God. And so that doesn't apply to every Methodist church. It did not apply to the church I grew up in. But it applies to many, many of them, and that's why my pastor encouraged me not to go into the Methodist church. Congregational churches often fall into this category as well. Uh, Some Presbyterians, and I want to use some with every denomination, there are many different kinds of Presbyterian churches. And so some have left the underpinnings of good theology in that way. Someone mentioned to me just in my office just a few minutes ago, I said, well, Unitarianism fits that, except that Unitarianism we would label in some ways as, as a, in, in a cult way. So Unitarianism was born out of this effort that of trying to say that everything is true at once, or we could call it being eclectic. So they began to deny that Jesus was a God and said there are many ways to heaven. And, and so that's the – so Unitarian has that kind of bent. Um, Disciples of Christ denomination in some ways, not everyone. I have a very close friend here in town. I'll bring him on the show sometime. He's a member of the Disciples of Christ denomination, but he, he, he believes Jesus and the Bible and very firmly in that camp. But there are many churches in that denomination who who would fall into this um, kind of more theologically liberal. We see this represented in what we call the Jesus Seminar, which I don't hear much about today, but its founding roots were in the Northwest and especially in Corvallis, Oregon. The Jesus Seminar speculated that out of the four Gospels, only six verses are true. All the other verses in the gospel are false, that they were made up by people. And so that kind of thinking really does a disservice to the church when you have people who are so-called theological experts speculating that the Bible's not true and, and that Jesus isn't who he said he is and it's, and it's made up. The modern-day version of that is from a theologian named Bart Ehrman who – wrote numerous books recently that that the Bible can't be trusted because we have copies of the copies of the copies and not the real thing. And so I have personally encountered college students who have read his books or been influenced by his thoughts and have ditched the faith. And nothing grieves me more as a pastor to see people who get started with Christ and get started growing and then have such severe doubts of the foundational things about Scripture, about who is Jesus, and they eventually just fizzle out and quit following. And so we might say, well, not a lot of people have these beliefs or they aren't really that prevalent. I see them as prevalent and I see them as as hindering people from growing Uh, in their faith as well. So when we talk about liberal and conservative churches, I just want to emphasize we're not talking about politics. We're simply talking about theological beliefs. And the differences show up historically from a few hundred years ago as the very underpinnings of the authenticity of the Bible were severely questioned, I would say even heckled by many people in Europe and especially in Germany, and that eventually spread to the United States as well. So at Grace Community Fellowship, we hold those near and dear that uh, we love the Bible. It's God's Word. Jesus is the real deal. He's the Son of God. He rose again from the dead, and the power that raised Him from the dead is the power that can change our lives, transformation. Otherwise, The only transformation available to you and to me is self-transformation. And that doesn't work very well. Just trying to reform your own behavior and beliefs and your actions and your bad habits. 
I need an outside power. I need Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, because the risen Savior has a message for us today, and that by grace and grace alone, through faith in Him, we can have a relationship with Him that transforms us deeply, and that is something that I've banked my life on, and I've seen hundreds of people transformed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. He was born of a virgin, crucified by Pontius Pilate, raised again from the dead, and dwells in our hearts when we believe in him. That's some stuff that Steve says today, and we'll be looking at some other things as we go, but grace and peace with you today.